Hi and welcome to our measuring evolution video here in our evolution unit. Uh, this is a picture of some moths on a tree. Because these are peppered moths, which are a famous evolutionary example. Looking at the changes in the coloration of the moths, there's two different colors, right? You've got a light color and a dark color. And it turns out that the frequency of the different colors changed as the coloration of the trees on which they live changed, which is pretty much exactly what you would expect if uh, this natural selection thing was actually the thing that was happening. But uh, that really just kind of is a, gets us into this notion of how, how do we measure evolution? How do we know it's happening? It's not going to be useful science if we can't measure it. So we're going to talk about that here, right? We're basically going to talk about Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium and then the effects that selection can have on a population and how that changes the distribution of phenotypes in a population. So let's get into it. So Hardy and Weinberg, there they are, Hardy and Weinberg. They came up with these notions independently of each other, contemporarily of each other. And so these are equations that describe uh, allele frequencies in a hypothetical non-evolving population. And so uh, for the gene pool, the frequency of the recessive and the dominant alleles added together has to equal one. And then in the population, the frequency of the three types of genotypes added together have to equal one. This is a non-evolving population. We'll talk a lot more about what this all means uh, right now, actually. You're going to see this slide a lot over the course of the year. This is how genetic information is transmitted. We have uh, seen this before. I'm not going to get too far into it right here. If you guys have any questions about this, you should really go back and check out our modern synthesis video because that is where this was first discussed. But let's go in and let's remind ourselves of a couple of things. Alleles are different versions of a gene. And in our simplified eye color in our smiley organisms, the big B allele is for brown eyes and the little b allele is for blue eyes. And so what we're doing for the Hardy-Weinberg equations is we're, we're just changing the terminology a little bit. The dominant allele, big B in this case, is going to be symbolized as a P, and the recessive allele is going to be symbolized as a Q. And since it can either be dominant or recessive, right? It can either be big B or little b. It can either be P or Q. If we're adding those up, they have to add up to a total frequency of one. In any population where we have this kind of simple inheritance situation with two alleles, dominant and recessive for a trait, the frequency of both of them added together has to equal one. So genotypes work a little bit differently. You could be big B, big B, in which case you're going to have brown eyes, or you could be big B, little b, in which case you're going to have brown eyes. So if you have two copies of the same allele, you're homozygous. So in the case of being big B, big B, you're homozygous dominant. Big B, little b, you are going to be heterozygous because you have one of each allele. But of course, brown is dominant over blue. And so in both cases, this is going to give you brown eyes. Little b, little b is going to be homozygous recessive. And that's because you have two copies of the little b allele, which is recessive. And the terminology in these equations, so big B, big B is going to be equal to P squared. Big B, little b is going to be defined as 2PQ. And little b, little b is going to be defined as Q squared. Let's go in and look at how this was determined. So how do we figure out these genotypes? Remember that anytime we do a cross in a sexually reproducing organism, we're going to have a male and a female. And so the male could either give you a recessive allele or a dominant allele, and the female could do the same. So they could either give you a P or a Q. So here are our possibilities, P and Q from mom, P and Q from dad. And so the odds of being any of the combinations here are going to work out as follows, right? If you get a P from mom and a P from dad, you're P squared. And that frequency is just the frequency of P times itself. And the same if you get a Q from mom and a Q from dad, then you're gonna be Q squared. And that frequency is going to be equal to Q times Q again. The heterozygotes are a little bit different because mom could give you P and dad could give you Q, in which case it's going to be P times Q, or dad could give you P and mom could give you Q, in which case it's still going to be P times Q. And so when we put these all together, we wind up with these as our genotypes in the formula, where P squared plus 2PQ plus Q squared, these are all of the possibilities we can have, and that's going to equal 1 as well. And just as a reminder, P squared is brown eyes, 
Q, Q is going to be brown eyes. They're both going to show the dominant phenotype, and Q squared is going to show the recessive phenotype. And so that's how we come up with the genotype formula for the Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium. Now, we're not going to use this video to solve Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium problems. There's a lot of other places you can go to do that, and we'll certainly do that in class if you are my student. It's just not really dynamic kinds of video stuff. Instead, I would just like to talk about this notion of Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium and the fact that no actual population is actually in Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium. It is an ideal non-evolving population. And in order to think about what would have to happen in a population in order for it to be in Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium, we have to think about the things that make an actual population evolve. And those things are natural selection, sexual selection, genetic drift, gene flow, and mutations. Mutations we really haven't talked about too much up till now, though you probably know that it is a change in the DNA. The other four you'll remember back from our evolutionary forces video, and if you don't, I would encourage you to go and check out that video before we move on. But since these things are all working in a real population, it's going to keep any real population from ever really being in Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium. So a population of Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium doesn't have these things working. That population would have to have no natural selection, which means the environment would never need to change because a changing environment is going to lead to natural selection. And there would have to be no sexual selection. So mates can't have a preference. Everybody just is totally randomly mating with each other because the minute we get mate preference, that's gonna drive sexual selection and there has to be no genetic drift. So the population has to be large. Remember when we talked about genetic drift, smaller populations had much bigger effects from genetic drift than larger populations do. No gene flow, so there can't be any immigration or emigration into or out of the population. The movement of individuals in and out affects the allele frequencies of the individuals in that population. And there can't be any mutations. Mutations are, by definition, changes in alleles. Right? A mutation is just a spontaneous change in the DNA, and if that's happening, then you're going to be affecting allele frequencies. So that can't be happening either. So those are our five conditions for a population to be in Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium, and those don't exist in the real world. So a good question would be, well, you know, why is Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium useful? And the reason is because we can compare a real population to what the population would be if it were in Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium, and that helps us figure out what is going on and helps us to inform our scientific investigations. If we discover that the population is way out of Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium and there's something, for instance, going on with the colors of tree trunks that these moths are on, then maybe that helps us narrow in on the role of natural selection in driving the evolution of this moth population, for instance. The other way that we can use it is that real populations can approximate Hardy-Weinberg populations. So as a result, even though the population isn't actually in Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium, it could be close enough that we could use Hardy-Weinberg calculations in order to anticipate or model what is happening with the frequencies of alleles in the population over time. So that's Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium. That's basically one of the major ways that we measure the effects of evolution. Uh, but we can look at those effects too and we can kind of see what is happening. And particularly with regard to selection, we see a couple of different things. So I'm gonna put up three different situations here and you're gonna see a frequency distribution of different phenotypes for three different populations. I'll, we'll talk about each one. And the red line is the population before selection and the blue line is the population after. So here we see a bunch of lizards with uh, different length tails, right? They're shorter over on the left and they get longer as we go to the right. And we can see that before, it was a relatively classic kind of bell curve, a lot of medium tails, not so much really short or really tall. And then after selection has happened, we can see that we have fewer of the extremes and more of the middle. That's what we'd call a stabilizing selection. Anytime we select against the extremes for a phenotype towards the middle, that's going to be the kind of classic stabilizing effect. Here's a different population. This population is of giraffes. And we can see that before selection, most of the giraffes had smaller necks. And after selection, most of the giraffes have longer necks. And so that's called the directional selection because we're moving the distribution of this phenotype from one distribution to another. We're directionally affecting that distribution, hence the term. And then the last one, and here we've got uh, some clams with different colored shells. And we can see before the before selection, it was kind of like the lizards with their necks. There weren't a lot of the really light or the really dark. 
there were uh, quite a few in the middle. And then after the middle's been selected against, and we've selected four the very light and four the very dark, that's called a disruptive selection because we are getting rid of that intermediate characteristic and selecting against that in four either extreme. So these are the three classic effects of selection, and it's a good thing for us to talk about them here while we're talking about uh, measuring evolution and how we can determine the effects of evolution on a population. So that's it for this video. Thanks so much for watching. Make sure you can do the following things here at the end. Make sure you can explain how Hardy-Weinberg represents alleles and phenotypes in a population. Make sure that you can describe the conditions necessary to maintain a population in Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium. Make sure that you can explain the applications of Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium in the real world. And finally, that you can describe the effects that selection can have on phenotypes in a population. If you can do all those things, you're doing great. If not, that's okay too. Take a moment, write down any questions that you have so that you can get the answers that you need. Thanks again for watching. I really appreciate it. Have a great day.